We want to read together. We're in Second Timothy this evening. Second Timothy chapter 2. We're going to read together the, the first 10 verses, please. Second Timothy chapter 2, beginning verse 1 to 10. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Those ten verses, and as always we trust that the Lord's blessing, his anointing, will be upon his own truth. For his name's sake. Now folks, we've already mentioned Timothy. We have been thinking about Timothy over this last Sunday night or two really. So we have. Someone who, it would appear, whom Paul seemingly led to the Lord in the town of Lystra. We mentioned this in the previous evening where you can read it there in the Acts of the Apostles. God moved in this young man's life And he became a great leader, pastored various churches, was sent on various assignments by the Apostle Paul, and eventually ended up in Ephesus where he was when this particular letter was written to him by Paul. The last letter, the last epistle that Paul ever wrote before he was martyred for his faith. You know, I talk with many Christians who feel that they are not as far on in their Christian walk as they feel they should be. And many ask why they don't see growth in their lives that they would like to see, or why are they not able to handle themselves as well as they ought to handle themselves in the face of temptation? Why are they not progressing the way that they feel that they should? And quite often you hear others talking about the Christian life as being so real and being so exciting, but theirs seems tedious, maybe a bit mundane, a bit ordinary. It's not not like what they have heard others say or not what they have read about. You could be sitting here tonight, perhaps you're saved, and you look at your Christian experience. Perhaps that's exactly how you feel. And you wonder, does it really measure up to the standard of the Word of God? You wonder, does it really measure up with others that you look at in the church of Jesus Christ around you? And you feel perhaps that you should be a lot further on than you actually are in your Christian walk. Although, let me say this to you, by the way. You look at other people and think they're going well in their Christian life, and you think you're you know, not as far on as you should be. You really talk to someone else, they'll tell you they feel exactly the same about their life. That they don't feel they're as far on in the Christian walk as they should be either. It's something that we all contend with at times. But as we think again this evening about the disciple or about discipleship, because that's really what we're tackling here as we think about Timothy, we have to remember that Jesus said, first of all, to go and to make disciples of all nations. We touched on this last Sunday evening. Folks, that's our job. Can I say tonight, if you're saved, that is your job. That is your commission from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason that we are here today. Did you know that that's the only valid reason for the church existing? That we make disciples. That we grow in discipleship 
as we seek to serve him, to make known his gospel, to proclaim his name, and to see lives touched for him and brought into discipleship. And so the question for us is, how do we do that? Or the question is, what do we really mean by that? Or here's another question. What kind of people does Jesus need? And I use that word need very lightly because God at the end of the day needs none of us. But what kind of people is Jesus really looking for? Who is able to step up to what the Lord Jesus Christ would have us to be and what he would have us to do? And then the big question for each one of us in particular is, are you that kind of person? In your own personal experience, are you that kind? And that's why we're looking at Timothy. Because many of us, I believe, can identify with Timothy as we see him in these epistles. You see, we think about this young man, we think about that particular time, we think about being an associate, if you want to call him that, with the Apostle Paul and the great work of mission and the ministry and the way the Holy Spirit was moving in the church at that particular time, the growth that they were seeing, the new churches that were being established, the new ground that was being taken for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's Timothy plumb smack in the middle of that. And he's sent on assignments, he becomes a pastor and so on. And folks, we're inclined to look at this young man and we're inclined to think, here's someone who was very special. And of course, if you're saved tonight, let me say you are special. And if you're not saved, dear one, you're special too. We'll get to that in just a moment or two. But sometimes we look at these people and we we set them up, so to speak. But I want us very quickly just to look at the kind of person that Timothy really was in himself. Can I start tonight by saying, first of all, that he was not a bold. He was not a strong. He was not a confident or courageous kind of man. He wasn't at all like that. And we can deduce that from things that Paul writes to him in these epistles. You know, he's probably the opposite of all of those things that we think about him. He was probably quite timid in himself. Let me read you verse 7 of what Timothy has to say in chapter 1. Sorry, what Paul has to say to Timothy in chapter 1 of this epistle. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Paul says to him, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Why is Paul saying that? Why does Paul have to write that to this young man? Because Timothy has a tendency to be timid. He's not forthright. He's not a bold young man. But he has a tendency to hold back and to be fearful, even to be reserved. He's also got a tendency to slack off at times. Do you ever slack off on your Christian walk? Timothy has a tendency to slack off. 2 Timothy 1, this time it's verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. If he hadn't let the gift of God dwindle in him, why does Paul have to exhort him to stir it up? You see, he's he's a young man, and that's another of his shortcomings. He has a tendency to slack off. And in fact, Paul says something similar to him in his first epistle, As he writes to him. Timothy he says God has gifted you. Stir this gift up. Don't sit back and hope. That somehow it's going to find its way out. No. It needs a disciplined stirring up. In your life. It seems that Timothy also needed to be encouraged. To do that. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. Paul says. Let no man despise thy youth. He looked at other people. He thought about his own age. And he wondered how he really fitted in there. Or wondered how he could lead people who were older than himself. He felt intimidated by older people. You know, some of our young people here feel exactly like that. I know some of you younger people who are sitting in this congregation tonight feel intimidated by some of us older people. Oh, no, you don't confess it to us. But you confess it to one another. And folks, the church of Jesus Christ is not like that. Everyone is special, irrespective of age, 
irrespective of race, irrespective of color. Everyone is special to the Lord Jesus Christ, chosen by him to fit a particular place. And I want to encourage our young people tonight, don't be intimidated by older people in the assembly. I hope and pray no one's ever intimidated by me. But I want to encourage you in that. Let no man despise thy youth. Don't feel inadequate. Don't feel insecure in the presence of older brethren and older sisters in the Lord. We all have a contribution to the worship of God and to the health and the soundness of the body of Christ in this place. Did you know that Timothy was even ashamed of the gospel at times? Have you ever been ashamed? Sometimes, some situation where you just couldn't say what you wanted to say. Oh, you wanted to say it. But somehow you just couldn't bring yourself to say about Jesus Christ in that situation. You see, he lacked confidence in situations where the gospel wasn't welcome or where there was hostility to it. He was ashamed of it. 2 Timothy 1 verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, no matter what it costs you, don't ever be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He was also ashamed of the Apostle Paul. Paul mentions that in that very verse that we have read together. And you know, you put all of this together and you think about this, this young man as he was whenever he was called to follow the Lord. Folks, do you see the kind of picture this gives us of what this young man was like? Can you identify with any of that? Well, let's go on. Because physically, he wasn't strong either. According to this epistle, he was probably very often sick. Sorry, I beg your pardon. According to 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, the apostle says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. He wasn't, hadn't the soundness of, of health. But he was often infirm. He was often afflicted. He was often sick. Use a little wine, Paul says, as medication. He also needed to toughen up a bit. 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, where Paul, we've already read the verse, but he says, Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, there is some suffering. And he talks to him quite a lot about that suffering through these epistles. Toughen up, Timothy. Face it. Don't hold back. The Apostle Paul in another place says, join with me in suffering for the gospel. And folks, that's the picture we get of Timothy in these verses. And forgive me for pulling all of those things out about him, but that's the picture we get about him. He's a reserved, retiring, physically weak, emotional, lacking stamina perhaps, Quite, quite, how would you put it? Backward in his ways. He's not your stereotypical hero. He's not someone that you stick up on a pedestal and say, oh, look at him. I'd like to be like him. And nevertheless, that's what he was like. And Jesus Christ had chosen him. Dear one, you could be sitting in this gathering this evening. You could be sitting here feeling as the most insignificant person in this crowd. You could be sitting here in this gathering this evening carrying a burden that no one else knows about. And you look at your life, maybe it's a mess. Or you look at the things that you're trying to contend with and you wonder what you will ever do. And you're thinking to yourself, what would Jesus Christ ever want to have anything to do with me for? What would he want to do that for? Can I say to you tonight, Jesus loves you just as you are. He loves you with all of the feelings. He loves you with all of the shortcomings. He loves you with all of the hang-ups. He loves you with all of the sin. He loves you with all of the baggage that life has placed upon your back. And tonight he just reaches out to you. And in love and in mercy and in grace that our young brother sang about tonight. He is grace sufficient 
to set you free from sin. He is grace sufficient to lift you out of anything that the devil has dragged you down into. And praise God tonight, there's grace sufficient to draw you and make you a disciple of his very own. Tonight, that's what Calvary is all about. Jesus died there upon the cross at Calvary, bearing our load of sin, taking our place, bearing our judgment, paying the price, shedding his blood, making atonement, making redemption possible for you and for me, that we can be saved. And he loves you tonight just as you are. There's no sin that he can't save from. There's no pit too deep that he can't lift someone up out of. There's nothing in life that he can't overcome by his grace in order that you can be set free. Can I ask you tonight, are you free in Christ? Are you saved tonight? Has there been a time in your experience when you trusted this wonderful Savior, you came to him just as you were? Because that's how he calls us tonight doesn't want us to wait until we're cleaned up. doesn't want us to wait until we're feeling something special. doesn't want us to wait until somehow we're stronger or more able or more acceptable. He calls us just as we are. And he calls us to come unto him. And it would be our prayer if you're in this gathering this evening without him. You don't know him. He is not your savior. It would be our prayer that you would reach out, that you would come to him tonight just as you are. And I tell you, praise God, he can change your life from the inside out and he can make you over anew and set you free. Now in these verses, Paul gives Timothy three images that probably scared him and probably scare most of us as well. We're not looking at them all tonight or anything like that. But Paul says in these verses that we've read together, Timothy, you need to be like a soldier. Then he says to him, you need to be like an athlete. And then he says to him, you need to be like a farmer. And Paul gives a reason for each. And so tonight, what I want to do very quickly before we close, is look at the first one that we find here. 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. Paul says to him, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does he mean whenever he says, be like a soldier? You see, folks, soldiers are trained. Soldiers are trained to be tough. Timothy isn't like that. And most of us, if truth be told, most of us are not like that either. But look at why Paul uses this image. He says here, first of all, endure hardship. You see, the whole idea of being a soldier is far removed from the thinking of many Christian people. For so many people, they're safe from sin, and they're on their way to glory. End of the story. But the story makes it abundantly clear that we're called to be soldiers in the army of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul sees us like that. Paul uses this image many, many times. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says we're engaged in a conflict. It's a cosmic war. And he says to engage that war the way we need to engage that war. He says we're to put on the full armor of God to fight in that war. Without the armor of God, we're weak. Without the armor of God, we're vulnerable. Because we're engaged in a war that's cosmic, that's spiritual. A war that we are not capable of engaging in on our own strength or our own stamina or our own ability. Even our own courage. And Paul reminds us of that. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because he says, he says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. As a Christian believer, you are called to engage that in the name of Jesus Christ. You are called to take authority over that in the name of Jesus Christ. Because you are called into this warfare and you're a soldier in the body, in the 
the armor and the army of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, put on the whole armor of God. Can I ask you tonight, if you're saved, are you involved in warfare? Or are you sitting back letting others fight the war instead of you? See, folks, many of us do that. We never take the time to pray. We certainly never take the time to support anything in prayer that's happening in church. Well, leave it to other people. Maybe you're one of these like Timothy that you think all our people are more capable than you. Listen, you're a soldier too. And you're called to be a part of that. You should be there. There's other things that we leave for other people to do as well. And we just stay back. We keep ourselves isolated. We exclude ourselves from the center of where it's all happening at. Are you like that tonight if you're saved? Paul says put on the whole armor of God. Now, that's not the specific image here in 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. But rather it's the idea if you are going to be a soldier, you will have to face and you will have to endure hardship. Folks, I've said from this pulpit before, and I'm no prophet, the church in this country has seen nothing yet of what it's going to experience. And there's hardship coming. And there's persecution that's coming. And there's affliction that's coming. Because we have an enemy tonight. And before this nation is through, if the church is to fulfill its commission, we will have to engage that enemy and strike the victory in Jesus' name. They're not even an amen in the house to that. Because we don't want this kind of stuff. I'm just saved and I'm on my way to glory. I tell you tonight, that's the way it's going to be. Why do you think refugees are flooding Europe? Why are they doing that? I'll tell you why. Because they're bringing Islam in a greater force. And the voice of Islam is going to be a stronger voice. And that voice is going to rise up in every single nation in the Western world until persecution hits the Christian like he has never seen it before. Is that happening by accident? No. Her brother sang tonight, God's sovereign over everything. And we're living in the end times. And the world is shaping up for all of the end times scenario that the word of God speaks about. And we don't set dates and we don't try to say when Jesus is coming. But let me say this to you tonight. The word scene, the stage is being prepared for the final scene in the great play that God has orchestrated upon the world. And all of these things are happening in the world around us. And folks, as a Christian church tonight, we need to have our eyes open. We need to get the blinkers off. And we need to realize where we are. The times that we're living in. The day that we're living in. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And we need to be engaging. Engaging the works of darkness. In the name of our blessed Lord and Savior. And to do that, we will have to face and we will have to endure hardship. You have to learn, Paul says, to live with and to endure hardship. Now remember, Paul, Paul wrote this from a prison cell. Paul's not theorizing. Paul's not giving some kind of a nice example. No, in chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher. And because of this, verse 12, he says, I also suffer these things. Look at verse 9 of chapter 2. He says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the word began. You see, he has called us unto himself. And the gospel message, which is antagonistic to an evil word, will bring the result of persecution and affliction. And Paul's a prime example. He was imprisoned. Paul was imprisoned a number of times. In Jerusalem, he was imprisoned, briefly. In Caesarea, he was imprisoned for two years. In Rome, he was imprisoned for two years. He spent a winter in Malta as a prisoner. And after he was released in Rome at the end 
of the Acts of the Apostles, he was re-arrested, he was re-imprisoned, and he was eventually martyred and executed for his faith in Jesus Christ. Now he says, Timothy, please don't think that you're going to be exempt from that. That's what he says to him. If you will really stand for the gospel, he says, Timothy, you're not going to escape any of that. Don't hold that stupid idea that if you are in the will of God, everything will go well in your life. Folks, that's fairy tale. That's fairy tale. Don't think it's all going to be comfortable. It's all going to be rosy. And there are plenty of teachers who teach that today. But that's falsehood and error. No, all who will live godly, the Bible says, and Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so he says, endure hardship as a good soldier. C.T. Studd wrote a book called The Chocolate Soldier. What a title. The Chocolate Soldier. He said the church is ineffective. Missionary organizations are short-staffed because there are too many Christian chocolate soldiers. When the heat is on, they melt away. Huh? Huh? I didn't say it, blamed C.T. Studd. But folks, that's truth. And Paul says, Timothy, don't be like that. And he says, Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, even though I am being treated like a criminal. You see, it seems that, it may seem that Timothy had, had some sort of shame about the fact that Paul was a prisoner. And Paul contrasts that to Onesiphorus. 2 Timothy 1, verse, verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Anisiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. He commends him for the fact that he wasn't ashamed. Paul's saying to Timothy, remember him. He wasn't ashamed, and you need to be careful not to be ashamed either, no matter what it's going to cost. And then Paul makes clear his own position. He says, I'm not ashamed. Verse 12 of chapter 1. For the, the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And listen to this. For I know him I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know him I have believed. Dear one, let me come back to you tonight. Can you say that? Have you a firm faith in Jesus Christ tonight? Can you say, I know whom I believed. And I'm persuaded that no matter what happens in life or in death, he's able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. Are you saved tonight? Can you say that from the depths of your heart with full assurance of faith? If you can't, then you need to trust him. You need to turn to him. You need to believe in him. You need to put your faith in him. I'm not ashamed. Folks, listen to me if you are saying, it's not always easy not to be ashamed. I'm not saying for one moment it is. There's so much said about Christianity. You know, back in the days of Paul and after those early disciples, the forefathers of the church, Rome blamed the fire of Rome upon the Christians. The Christians were called at one stage cannibals. The Christians were accused of having immorality and sex orgies and all that kind of thing. There was all sorts of despicable things that were spoken of God's people back at that time. They were classed as terrorists of their day because they claimed to follow a different king than the emperor of Rome. And so they were seen as enemies of the state. They slaughtered them in the Colosseum until in the Colosseum, the people got so sickened with how well Christian people died for Christ that they didn't bother going there anymore. There was no sport in it. What's the sport seeing a lion rip someone to pieces while they're singing praise to a saviour? 
And eventually the whole, that whole scene in the Colosseum came to an end because people just got sick of the murder and the blood and there was no sport in it because people died willingly for the cause of Jesus Christ. How the church needs to wake up. That's how they lived. And Paul says, listen, Timothy, that's for your heart. And folks, if we're to engage in war, if we're to live for Christ, that's where we are today. But what do we do today? In our churches today, we try to accommodate people. We try to be the same as people. We water down what it means to be a Christian. We preach a gospel that's so spineless. Ask Jesus into your heart and you'll go to heaven when you die. All will be well. And thank God for the truth of that. But folks, it's only half the story. Only half the story. Nothing confrontational about that. What a fantastic invitation. But you see, it doesn't address the root of man's separation. And it doesn't address the root of man's alienation from God. It doesn't address the corruptness of the human nature that Christ came and had to die upon a cross for. Folks, we're corrupt to the very core. We're sinners by nature. The very nature within us is evil. We're born with our backs to God. And the gospel message has got to address that. But we water it down. Ask Jesus into your heart. No, no. My Bible says God commands all men everywhere to repent. That's salvation. That's how you get saved. You turn from your evil, wicked ways. You turn from your sin. You offer to Christ your life in exchange for the life that he gave for you. And you set upon the road as a disciple to follow him no matter what it costs. And at the end of the day, you'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Folks, that's real salvation. That's what the Bible teaches salvation is. And whenever we preach the gospel without telling people that they are sinners who need to be changed, whose lifestyles need to change, we produce decision makers who are still sinners, unrepentant, unchanged. And our churches are full of them. I wonder, are you one of them tonight? I wonder, are you one of them? But you see, don't offend anybody. Don't offend anybody. Back in the days of Paul and Timothy, they died because they offended people. Are you prepared to do that tonight? Be a soldier. Be a soldier of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 57, it says, They took offense. At Jesus. They were offended by what he told them. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes about the offense of the gospel. In Corinthians, he writes about the cross as being offense to the Jews and a stumbling block to the Greeks. In our churches today, we are too concerned about our reputation. Don't offend anybody. Don't offend them. And we go through makeovers in our church to disguise the uniqueness of the gospel. And folks, we are not being the army of Jesus Christ. We're not soldiers. We're wimps. If that's the road we're going down. Paul says, Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel, the testimony of our Lord or of me. Endure hardship as a good soldier. Give me two minutes and finished. Endure hardship as a soldier. And he says, any man who wars does not entangle himself again with the affairs of this life. Verse 14. He talks about minor issues. We'll not read the verses. Verse 16. He talks about gossiping. Verse 23. He talks about arguments. He says, no, don't get caught up with stuff like that. Preach the word. You see, folks, there are two kinds of soldiers in any battle. There are soldiers on the front line. And there are soldiers here in the barracks. In any army, that's where they stand at. Those who are on the front line, they'll talk about the enemy. They'll talk about strategy. They'll talk about tactics. 
They'll talk about resources. They'll talk about their weapons. They'll talk about tending to the wounded. They're probably tired. They're probably weary. But they are energized by adrenaline that's flowing. Because they're in the thick of the battle. Frontline soldiers. The ones in the barracks. They'll be talking about the food being bad. They'll be talking about the bed being too hard. They'll talk about the coffee being too cold. Some difference, isn't there? Some difference. The bad weather. The poor conditions. The person who did something on them. And our churches are full of that kind of people well, as well. Paul says, Timothy, you have got to be disciplined enough to focus on the task like a soldier. And it's not a very pleasant task. And it's not a comfortable picture. It's demanding. It's tough. But God calls ordinary people like you and like me, Timothy, to engage with him in this onslaught against evil. And so tonight you could be sitting here and you need to get out of the onslaught of evil. And the only way out of that is to trust in Jesus Christ. Or you could be here tonight and you could be saved and it's time you got engaged in that onslaught against evil. But friends, this is a word for every single person in this house. Wherever you stand out with the Lord, tonight we need him more than we could possibly imagine. Whether it be for salvation, whether it be for grace, anointing, courage, whatever it might be, we need him. And he is God's answer to our every deed. And I'm asking you tonight to engage with him right now. Let's pray. Jesus. You know your own life tonight. You know your own heart. Ordinary people. But people who go through with Jesus Christ do extraordinary things. And tonight he's calling you. Where are you at in your journey? Do you know him as Savior and Lord? You need to turn to him tonight. Seek his forgiveness. Offer your life to him. And thank him for dying for you at the cross of Calvary. You're saved tonight. Not along the road, maybe as far as you want to be. But he can do great things with you and through you. If you will surrender fully unto him. And that's what we're asking you to do, believer, tonight. And Father, I pray this evening, Lord, that you will take the things that we have looked at. The seriousness of the issues at hand. Lord, whether that be some soul that's on its way to a lost eternity that needs salvation. Or whether it be some Christian, Lord, who's sitting at ease. At ease, Lord. Whenever others are paying the price on the battlefront for Jesus' sake and name. And Lord, we pray tonight for grace. Grace, Lord, for every person that's bowed before you this evening. We thank you for every head that's here. We thank you for every person. Lord, no one's here tonight by accident. Our brother sang it tonight, Lord. You're sovereign. You're sovereignly over us. You're sovereign over everything. No one here tonight by accident, Lord. And we pray that you will take your word now and that you will apply it to our hearts in whatever way that might be. And we ask, Lord, for fruit. Fruit, Lord, it's your word in your hand. Holy Spirit, make it fruitful for Jesus' name's sake and for his glory. Amen. Amen.